system, serving customers in southwestern Virginia and West Virginia with energy, stewardship, and community. Additional support was provided by the Bedford County and Franklin County offices of economic development and by the members of Blue Ridge PBS. Thank you. We heard there was going to be a lake, and that was the dream. The dam sitting in that gorge is an amazing feat to me. It's an ideal spot for one, and it turned into a marvelous recreation area. Seeing that water, though, was really something. Back up on your property, you know, we saw water trickling back on the land. The lake is very natural in its surroundings, and it has really healed itself from construction. It's as close to a natural lake as you could get. It's the most wonderful place to live that you can imagine. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. Mosquitoes aren't too bad. Uh, there's very few things can eat you. So it's just a wonderful place to live and raise children. I would say that Smith Mountain Lake truly is like the jewel in Southwest Virginia. Smith Mountain Lake, 500 miles of shoreline, 40 miles long with a surface area of over 20,000 acres. Located in Bedford, Franklin, and Pennsylvania counties, it is an economic driver for the area. Many visit for recreation. Many call it Shore's home. Thousands of years before the lake, Native Americans inhabited the area. When I was in college at William and Mary, I corresponded with Carl Miller. Carl Miller did the archeology span for Smith Mountain Lake. And I remember one of the interesting things Carl told me was he was so impressed with the fact that he found so many flutes on the Smith Mountain Lake properties that the Indians apparently were very musical. The first recorded white settlers came to the area in the 1670s. Smith Mountain and ultimately the lake were named for two settlers, Daniel and Gideon Smith, who arrived on the mountain in 1740. Dating back to the pioneers of that century, on the north side of the Blackwater River in Franklin County stand the landmark twin chimneys built in 1795. Once part of the Gwyn Dudley home, they are on the Virginia and National Register of Historic Places. As the land was settled, it was primarily agricultural and would remain so for generations, up to the time construction of the lake took place. Throughout the area, tobacco barns and small family cemeteries still dot the landscape, signs of the area's rich history. Yeah, this is the Roanoke River running here, north to south. And when I was a young boy, I used to ride pole boats up and down this river. And of course, we would pack our food and fish a little bit and look for our heads and swim a while. There was a mile long bottom where the water is today. One farm affected by the rising water was owned by the Bernard family. They raised tobacco and livestock. Cattle, mainly. But you know, you always have little piggies <laughs> and things like that. But my husband mainly was into Black Angus. He liked the cattle. When it started out, it was just all farm country and river bottoms with the river flowing through the mountains, you know, and they farmed the river bottoms, fished the river, and the people coming in now probably can't even visualize what it looked like then. It was country then. Now it's not. Talk of a dam in the gap at Smith Mountain began as early as 1906. It was officially proposed in 1924 when the Roanoke Stanton River Power Company was formed. The possibility of a dam being built affected business in the region, including a local railroad. The F&P was the Franklin and Pennsylvania Railroad, and it meandered down through the countryside here because the land goes up and down like a roller coaster in a lot of places. So they had to follow a path where it was more or less level. It started running on the 1st of May, 1880, 
and it ran until 1932 in April. It went on down through each little town or village, just like Glade Hill here. About the time the railroad was coming to an end, in uh, 1928, a group of men that were trying to get the Pittsville branch to use for hauling lumber, they wrote a letter to the Southern, and they said in the letter they understood that those tracks, they probably wouldn't be able to lease them for an extended period of time because they were going to be used for hauling materials for the construction of a dam that they were planning on building on the river out on Smith Mountain coming through the gap. As it turned out, the uh, branch being extended over to the gap there in the mountain never did materialize. In the 1930s, it was concluded the dam wasn't economically feasible, but the idea of a dam in the gap didn't go away. Prompted by the need for flood control, in 1945, the Roanoke River Basin Association was formed to promote the construction of dams in the region, including a dam at Smith Mountain. Appalachian Power Company purchased the land and rights from the Roanoke Stanton River Power Company in 1954. The Federal Power Commission approved Appalachian's license in April 1960 for a hydroelectric power facility and the massive construction project that was to change the face of the area got underway. The Smith Mountain Pumped Storage Project consists of two dams and lakes. Using pencil and a slide rule, the double curvature arch dam on the Roanoke River at Smith Mountain was designed by 25-year-old Dr. Jeffrey Fong. It is 816 feet wide and 235 feet high, with five generating units that on average generate 435,000 megawatt hours per year. Downriver from Smith Mountain is Leesville Lake and Dam. The lake at 17 miles in length with 100 miles of shoreline is much smaller than the upper lake. The Leesville Dam is a concrete gravity dam with two generating units. During peak demand, water flows through Smith Mountain Dam to Leesville Lake to generate electricity. When demand is lower, the pumps can be reversed and the water returned to Smith Mountain Lake to be used again. When I went down there, the road wasn't even completed. The last two miles going into Smith Mountain, there was no road. They was clearing the stumps out of the road when I got there. And uh, the excavation contractor had, had already arrived, and he was working from the top of the mountain on the Bedford County side. I was just off the farm and applied for a job, and they put me with the engineers, and that just suited me to a T. I was fascinated about starting a project like that almost from the get-go. The river was still flowing through when I went, and just to see it constructed was real interesting. Uh, initially, they had a microwave phone on a pole <laughs> on the Bedford County side, but our little survey shack on the Pennsylvania County side, the only way we could get to the phone was a boat. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, pretty primitive. One of the key components of the Smith Mountain Dam is concrete. 175,000 cubic yards went into its construction. To facilitate moving the concrete and other materials, a cable over 1,000 feet long was put in place 325 feet above the riverbed. They mixed the concrete up on the hill. They didn't bring it in in trucks. They made it right there on site, way up on the mountain. They had a four yard and six yard bucket to drop the concrete from, and a track that went from the batch plant to where the cable started and they could pick it up and carry it across to where the pole need to be. But the biggest thing I always thought when I first saw them doing it, how much six yards was, and then people just walk right up on top of it as, as if it was almost set up because it was so thick. I worked in the civil engineering department. We um, had to go out and check forms that the contractor put up to make sure they are perfect. and. Anything that's supposed to be in that form, such as pipe anchors, steel, we have to check all that, and make sure they're in the right location before we could sign it off to be poured in concrete. The dam was built up in concrete sections, and we would go and survey everything related to as the dam was coming up, you know, 
climbing around on those ladders that you had to get to those pores. Sometimes the ladder would be almost straight up or worse than straight up, and I, that was unnerving. It was very interesting to have the head of the concrete division come in the office and he would be talking about how many pours they were gonna have and mixing it and the whole setup was amazing. You know, here these men are designing and setting up this pulley system that's on the side of the mountain. It was just amazing. It was dumped into lo real large containers that were swung up and down the river to whatever part of the dam was needed. And this was a railroad car built on tracks that would allow it to move up and down the river, and it was anchored on the far side, just into the hillside. Uh, must have been really anchored well, because that cable would even move bulldozers around. When they pick that concrete up, that old cable would just yeah, it was a lot of weight. Everything that went into the dam had to be set with the cable weight. Some of the machinery was huge. You had the pin stalks, which was the big tubes coming out of the dam into the turbines. And you had your water wheel, you had your scroll case, and then you had your generators, your transformers. It was amazing to see things that they, you know, would do down there, could do. After a stint in the Army, former tobacco farmer Abner Jacobs went to work at the Lower Dam, Leesville, in 1961. I transferred to the concrete lab at Smith Mountain Dam. It was seven employees worked at the concrete lab, four on a day shift and three at night. And I worked at night. I would make up concrete cylinders we would test those cylinders to see if the PSI was OK. The concrete was tested for strength in intervals of 7, 14, and 28 days, as well as six months. For several of the staff in the construction office, working at the dam was one of their first jobs. And for some, it put them on a lifelong career path. It was amazing how many people in Franklin County got a job and then went on and used it for the rest of their life, what they were taught down at the dam site. I don't think we knew at the time what the dam really was going to mean to Franklin County and the surrounding areas. I don't think nobody had, had the vision to see what was going to happen with the results of it, and it's marvelous. I had worked a little bit in surveying with a local surveyor in Rocky Mount, Virginia. I knew enough to be dangerous, I guess. So I was hired in in the survey team, surveying different parts of the dam as it was constructed. Very interesting. We kind of worked as a group out of the construction office and made a lot of good friends. It was just a good job, because I was a local kid just starting out, and uh, it was a little different than, than going to work at one of your local factories and what have you. J.D. Butler worked as a timekeeper. Each one of us had so many men that we had to look after each day. If they worked 10 hours, 12 hours, you had to be there with them. Each time they moved, you had to change the description of what they was doing unless they worked in the same place, you know, all day long. And after a while, you got to, you know, got to be good friends with all of them, and they, you know, they treated you just like you would want them to uh, treat, treat them. The ones I had were the general contractor. They were the ones who were actually building the dam itself, which took care of the building the forms to take care of the concrete when they poured it. And then I had the electricians, which took care of the putting in the conduit and wiring and stuff, which went in the concrete when it was poured. I transferred down to the office where I worked in the cost accounting office. I would compile the man hours where the timekeepers would bring in from out where they was keeping up with the time of the people working on the dam. I would take that information, compile it on a sheet, how much money we was going to owe that particular contractor for that given month. 
It was a construction site, but the girls that worked there and even the men in the office, they dressed up and the girls dressed up with no such thing as blue jeans. I was secretary to the resident engineer, Earl Snodgrass. Appalachian benefited me in so many ways. The engineers just taught me so much about their jobs. It was, to me, better than a college education because I had this job and learned from the civil engineers, rode in the helicopter with the civil engineer, and I would take dictation as he was photographing and looking at the job site where the land was going to be underwater. And I even got to go under Hells Ford Bridge when it was finished. The helicopter went under the bridge before it filled up, of course. So it was just wonderful. And here I am. I have my own construction company now, so it was very, very instrumental to me. Joyce Kreider worked at the dam as a clerk typist, then became the bookkeeper, dealing with millions of dollars. I was asked to go to be the bookkeeper. And it was quite something, because I had had bookkeeping, typing, shorthand in high school. But I had to be trained by her. And I wrote it all in a shorthand tablet, my notes, because she was leaving. There was nobody there to show me. It was interesting, because once I entered everything, the first month without her, you push a button. And if it doesn't come up, zero. But it did. But I loved it. I loved it. Mr. Snodgrass was our resident engineer. And we loved him, and he was so good to us. He told us girls, you got, you got my permission to wear shorts. And he said, we're going to take you on a boat ride. And it was wonderful to be able to see all of that water and, and to be on it. That's the first time I'd seen all of that since I'd been working there. And I'd been working there five years at that time. Many of the staff carpooled to get to work at the dam. Appalachian had a fleet of station wagons that picked people up all over Franklin County and drove them in a carpool to work and brought us home in the afternoon. It was very nice to have that because keep in mind, we were at a construction site and it was dusty, very dirty. And when it rained, it was muddy. <laughs> and when it rained a lot, it was really muddy. It take about 45 minutes, maybe, or 50 from Rocky Mount to get to the dam site. So it was, that was fun as well, <laughs> riding back and forth with them. Workers at the dam site had company in the form of local wildlife. We had a wild goat there on the mountain, and he was quite an attraction for the uh, people, but you didn't see him too often until we put a nanny goat up there. Then we had little goats. That old goat, he was, he was quite a character. You know, when you work in an office, I don't care where it is, where it was then or now, if somebody comes in and says something unusual, oh, you do see us outside, and everybody gets up and goes out. So we would go out to the front door if the goat was out there. I saw the goat many times, many times. He used to come out on, up on top of the mountain, up on a rock and what have you, and just kind of watch in the evenings. One time, the goat started down on the pour where they was pouring concrete, which is probably up 150 feet above the riverbed. And some of the people got the bright idea that they was going to run that goat off of that dam. Wrong. The goat got mad and came down and ran everybody off <laughs> because it didn't like the noise. Well, you're watching a wonderful new documentary. You're seeing it for the very first time here on Blue Ridge PBS. We've just produced this, and uh, I'm fortunate enough to be standing here with my colleagues.